there you are. <laughs> Look, there's an L. So what I do is I'm going to grab this pencil. I'll show you my kind of non-photo blue pencil kind of quick sketching here. Um, so this owl that you're looking at, um, you're looking at a little bit of a three-quarter view. Maybe it's even turned away from you. And so owl head sticks up, body down at a bit of an angle. Uh-oh, sneeze. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry about that, everybody. Didn't have time to mute. Um, so here is I'm putting in a very blocky, blocky head, and that's going to make this thing look kind of owly. And uh, sort of you, owls have a solidity to them, so I want to kind of get that. And let's say this is a three-quarter view. We're looking down its back here down its tail. That means it's going to have, I'm going to put, see here's the, that center line down the back. I'm going to put a little bit of a V down its back, but I'm not going to make a symmetrical V like that. If there's something that is symmetrical and it's wrapping around the back of a critter, it's going to be a straighter line here, a more out line here. And that's, that's how a, that would foreshorten. Gonna make this line a little bit lighter, so that's where they're gonna be the top of the wings. Um, so there's 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 little owl block in, and I want to get a sense of that crazy camouflage pattern over the back of this this really cool critter. So I am going to, let's see, what are we going to do with the head? The head can be turned away from us, making the owl easier to draw. Um, and if I'm out there and the head is turned away from me, I draw it with the head turned away from me. But I'm going to, let's say you, you're you out there, I'm going to just sort of get some notes in here for a head turned away from you view. But now, every once in a while, it turns its head back towards you, and you are seeing this little kind of dish of an owl face. So if you've seen the video that I did on drawing owls, you know that there's that big V in the forehead. And that's going to make these things It'll be kind of just head sort of looking over its own back. So there, there's some uh, preliminary drawing here. Um, preliminary drawing. I've got sort of the V of my forehead here. I'm going to zoom in on this so you can see the face a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> now, if that we're doing kind of this back view here, the back view is going to be a little bit easier to do because there's no. Um, what I try to do is sort of think about like what are the planes of this. So there's the plane of the head that is going back here, then somewhere in here it starts to turn, and then here's the other side of the head in here. So if the light is coming from this direction here. Then this side of my owl's head is going to be more in shadow. And owls, the back of the head is covered with these. There are, if you look at a feather, if we plucked out a feather from this owl, you'd see lots of feathers with this sort of general shape where there is a central dark mark like that. And then there are these little things like that. At this distance, these little side branches aren't going to really show very well, especially on something like the head. And so but, but what you will get is just sort of a little kind of sense of these lines going down. And so there's a few just little 
lines on the back of the head, little, those, those sorts of things. This side of the head again, it's gonna be all in shadow. Let's jump over to this one here and see what we can do. So there's gonna be a zone of scapular feathers in here. There's gonna be back feathers up in here. Um, I'm going to think of wrapping these little center mark lines down sort of around the, the, the bird in here. I'm making some of these sort of the lines on the bird and notice that these are just sort of consistently inconsistent little marks in here. Sort of on the side, here's the bottom of those scapular feathers. Here's the wing. And on owls, if you look at an owl photograph, you cannot see that sort of wing structure very well, feather, 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 because they've got soft edges, and then they've got all these cryptic patterns on them. So very often, what you're going to sort of see is just some, some little lines and some little crossbars, little lines and little crossbars. So I want to think of little lines coming down and then little crossbars across those. And that gives you a suggestion of owly texture. Um, in here in the wing, um, my recollection is there, there's sort of some broader wing bars. And I'm gonna put some of those across. There we go. <clears throat> On the back, I'm gonna just put some lines kind of curving around the form of this bird. Here's the wing on the far side. Tail is just gonna be some little bars. On the belly of this bird, it's just some little down bars. And I'm gonna put a few little kind of cross marks across those. I notice that some places I'm kind of emphasizing the down, other places you see to see more of those cross bars. And you want it just sort of to be, have a feeling of being more randomly placed. Actually, I'm gonna have this branch be a little bit more skinny so that that tail sticks down below the branch. I want that. Now, I've been avoiding the head. <laughs> Might as well go there now. Um, but on this, this head, um, see, I'm going to start just with an eye. And often you kind of get this sort of nice sort of dark that you'll see around the eye. On the far side of the head here, I'm really not going to put in much at all um, because it's, it's being hidden by both the shadow. Here is that big facial disc. And on owls, there's a little beak from the front. You're going to see a little beak coming down. And then there's a fluff of feathers that sort of curves down like this on either side of the beak. And so from this side here, I'm just going to a little line that suggests you've got a beacon here and a little bit of fluffiness. And now I'm going to make some lines horizontally across the head here, make that into a big flat plane. And These, this is kind of interesting. I, I started off with more of a flat line here, but then decided just to kind of puff it out a little bit 
And I think that just sort of makes the head kind of feel like it's rocking back a little bit more. Feels like this head is sort of a little bit tucked back. This side of my owl is in shadow. And that means that the shadow is going to be down here on this branch as well. For fun, let's drop some watercolor in on this and we're going to just sort of make this owl at sunset. Here's my large fine point water brush. I'm gonna zoom back so that you can see the a little bit of the, the process that I'm doing here and be able to watch me mix my colors and things like that. Um, Before, let's actually add a few more branches in on this tree. So here's another branch that's going out here. It's going to go behind this owl. And back here, I'm going to put in some other branches. Um, I really like when I'm out looking at real owls out there. I, I look at the real negative shapes and things that I'm seeing in branches. You know, this feels just a little bit too horizontally. So I think compositionally, artistically, it'll be a little bit more interesting if I put in a branch here at a different angle. So I'm going to just get rid of that one and I'm going to have this Oh, see if I if this comes out here, both these branches will emerge at quite exactly the same place. Don't want that kind of overlap, so I'm going to move this branch down here. There we go. This branch is I like that. All right, now I am going to put some watercolor in with this birdie. Also going to use this flat brush, this chisel shaped brush. This is a wonderful brush just for kind of getting some randomness in there. This brush allows me to have a little bit more control and be precise. So let's make this um, late in the evening. Sun is going down, and because of the fires, there's a lot of color in the air. Um, so I'm going to just warm up some of the, the gunk that I have here on my palette. I will often just sort of go into that for an initial hit. As you're doing this, Jack, could you say something about the choices you make when you make the background fill color like this. You sort of explained it here, but do you often choose a complementary color relative to maybe the dominant colors in the owl or here are you capturing the night sky or the, you know. Yeah, I'm imagining sort of night or... sky out here and that this owl then is, um, the owl is, you're sort of, you're, you're it's, it's, it's really getting dark and, but sort of close to the horizon, there's sort of a glow in the sky. And so that is what I'm doing with my, my orange. And I put down a pretty heavy wash of, of, of orange there. It's interesting to see what happens though, when you kind of give yourself something like that orange for sky color. It's, it's the odd thing is that it still works. The same for watercolor. You see all sorts of interesting colors in the sky and water. We usually just put in blue, but 
when we see the kind of final picture, it's, it's going to look okay. It's going to look, people see that and they'll be like, oh, it must be sunsetty. I'm now going to turn sideways and I have a, um, I've got a hair dryer. I'm going to hit this with it. You may have to unmute Jack. I just muted you briefly. Ah, sorry about that. It's okay. Thank you for your help keeping me on task here. Now let's let's check this guy out. Um, this is it's 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 getting really dark. It's late, and so you're not going to see a full range of colors in this, but it's going to be mostly shapes. Um, and silhouettes. So I'm going to now grab some of my, um, let's, I'm going to start with the owl and then build out the stuff around it. I want some of the detail still to be visible on my owl. And um, let's see here. test this color on the side here. Yeah, that'll work. Um, so where's this? The sun will be kind of coming from the back here through to the owl. There will be some There we go. And just letting I'm letting a little bit of light still be on the back side of this owl. Um, no, I don't think I want that. I think I'm going to actually just darken my whole owl. There we go. So there's a little undercoat of color. And I will be going from lighter and I'll be building up to darker. And while that's drying, what I'm going to do is just start playing around with some of the trees around it. I'm mixing up some uh, Bloodstone Genuine, which is one of my favorite sort of dark brown colors. It's sort of a purplish brown. And I'm just going to come down this tree trunk. If I put in kind of a dark anchor like this early on, what it's going to do is it's going to force me to um, to, to make sure that I really kind of go dark with my values. If I want this to look like sunset sort of a thing, then this is going to need to really go to dark. There's another branch out here. And see, I'm now just sort of, I'm painting with the corner of this flat brush. And I'm also going to put in just some branches, some branches with this that I haven't drawn in. And to get branch shapes, the best thing to do is always just to look at the shapes of branches that you're really seeing around you. Otherwise, you get kind of cartoony branch shapes that don't look really like that type of tree. You know, Douglas fir branches are going to have very different kind of angles and stuff than you're going to see on... Um, 
on on uh, say a ponderosa pine. Here I'm making them up, which is dangerous. <laughs> Um, and actually, I think I want down here under this, I want there to be forest down here. So I'm going to take brown again, and I'm just going to say that there's actually way back here, there is, there's forest, there are trees. These are the tips of some of these trees coming up. And so I'm just making vertical marks with the side of the brush and some side to side motions with the brush like this to be kind of horizontal units of branches. So much for my great idea of the lightning round for now. But maybe this is, this is yeah, drawing sunset forest. I'm not, no longer doing an owl, I'm now doing a sunset forest. Now, if I want this branch here to really kind of feel like it is in the foreground, this branch should stick out beyond this frame a little bit and be a little bit darker. So I'm gonna get more Bloodstone Genuine on my brush. Come back in here. Now, <clears throat> there's this very pale owl on these very dark branches, so I'm gonna fix that. I actually want a little bit of a branch coming to, oh, that didn't want that to be that dark. Well, now it is. All right, now I'm gonna put this brush down for a moment and I'm gonna grab this one. And what I'm gonna do is just, first I'm gonna dry the tip off. So I'm not bringing too much water into my painting. And I'm going to think of, um, just sort of putting in some kind of key dark marks that are going to Start to kind of form pattern of this owl. And a lot of the detail that I'm putting in right now, I am not going to see in my final drawing because um, it is, they will be covered up by dark marks, but I'm, so I'm kind of going fairly dark some vertical and horizontal slashes. All right, now I'm gonna sort of darken the whole owl to get it to sort of fit into this sort of nighttime moody landscape a little bit. All right, just sort of take, taking tree color here, and pulling it into the owl. And as I come across the owl here, my brush is running out of paint. So what I get is an effect where it's darker over on this side and it got lighter here because this water brush, what was going on is as it was stroking across, it got, it got lighter from here to here because water brushes, when they run out of paint, they still, the water is coming down. But the, um, uh, 
um, but they, they just get a little bit more washed out. I think I might just leave that eye glowing through there because it's kind of fun. So you see how I, I got this, I'm actually gonna come in here. You can see the pencil strokes showing through here on some of these wing bars. Not all of my pencil strokes have shown through. Some of my brush strokes showing textures th show through. Um, some of the pencil strokes do. And together those give you just a little bit of a sense of texture on this thing. Now I'm gonna let this dry one more time. And so in a moment, I'll be right back. I can, with a pencil, come in and do what um, illustrator Ann Cottle calls just crisping up the edges. So just sort of punch this in here a little bit to say, like, look, that's the, the edge of this owl right in here. So I'm not doing it heavy line over the entire thing. Some places the texture is suggested by those brush strokes, some places that pencil is showing through. If I want, I can put a little bit more barring in there. That was a little bit heavy. So I'd clean my brush, take a little bit of that out. And when that dries, I think that'll be a little bit more, more subtle. Um, and this gives you a sense that there is sort of, there are complicated patterns here in these feathers and you can't see all of the complicated patterns and all of the detail, but you get the sense of that kind of texture in it. If I want to put this bird further in the forest, what I can do is just add a series of more vertical trunks where I am, you know, we've got this tree that is close to you here. So I could, again, I could, I'm saying that I could stop this drawing right here. Um, I can also put in more trees in the forest. So here is, here's a distant trunk of another tree. And then here is, here is another one that's back here. And I'm going to put in some trunks of different sizes. And so here is another tree trunk. That's back there. And these trees have branches off of them. So there's my major trunks. And then I'm going to put in with the tip of this brush, some branches coming first out from the tree.
And some of the ones that go out from the tree can be the branches that have, that are the longest. All right, so there's a long, tree branches. And some are going to go this direction. Now, so this bird is a little bit more in the woodsy. Now, I'm going to put in some tree branches that are at more of a downward angle, but the, some of those will be shorter. So I'm going to put in some shorter ones at a downward angle. I think my, there we go. Some shorter ones at, so longer out to the side. And if you're wondering why about that, I'll make a little diagram for you in just a second. That branch there ended up being a little bit too thick. I wanted that one to be thinner, but it ended up being thick and oh well. And finally, I'm going to put some clumps of needles on those distant trees. So there'll be some places where, actually, here's, here's this, is, this will be cool. This is, I can create some really cool needles with taking this flat chisel brush, giving it a slight turn so that the end becomes a little bit more ragged. I'm going to pick up some paint, test it off on the side, and I want it not quite as ragged as that. There we go. And now what I'm doing is I'm just kind of coming in here and tapping it in. Those are clumps of needles on some of these Push some of the darkness, even greater darkness up there into those needles. So there your owl is really in the woods. Looking now at how light my owl is relative to everything else in here makes my owl feel just a little bit anemic to me. So what I think I'm going to do is just increase the value range on parts of my owl, get a few parts of that owl to pop it out. So Jack, in this case, you're kind of drawing, um, you matching colors out of your imagination. Yes. You have um, tips. The best thing to do is when you're out there, you have some reality in front of you. Mm-hmm. Um, here I'm just sort of going by memory and um, yeah, just sort of seeing what is in in the in my memory there. Um, tips for how people can kind of start to match the colors they see in person. Um, I think some beginning watercolors are finding it challenging if they are trying to mix the colors and figure out how they can do that. On the spot, are there techniques that you've developed, or do you mm -hmm. rely on single pigments? And let, let me hit that in just a moment here. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, here, the more important. So, first of all, more important than matching the color is getting the values. So, if the values, that's the darks and lights on your picture, make sense and are solid, your picture will work. But 
um, and you're, you're, you, because we actually are used to seeing colors all over the map because on, you know, the sun starts to go down and the owl starts to turn orange and that the green grass starts to turn orange and all these other weird things. We're used to seeing colors in weird places and your brain will forgive those. But what our brains don't forgive is things that are off in value. So if there is part of a drawing and the values, the difference between lights and darks look off, people will really pick up on that. Um, So this is just about ready for me to leave it alone. Probably the leave it alone point was bridge was crossed a while ago. Um, let me see here if I can. Sometimes people have trouble with the water brush um, and it's hard to tell, are you removing pigment right now or are you trying to dry it out when you go back to your I, I'm I'm just sort of smoothing, smoothing out this, this dark into this, this light here and sort of making that that gradation a little bit more smooth. Yeah, I think I kind of like this guy. Let me back up for it just a moment. Yeah. Um, here it is. Little owl. It's a nice question. Have you, when you see owls, do you see them more often when they're perched or on the wing? Oh, I, 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 often, I think I often, more often see them perched. Every once in a while you see one fly by. Um, the exception to that is uh, recently my family and I have been, made a few trips down to Wavecrest uh, on the Sonoma coast. Um, there's a, a place down there, it's a, a bunch of trees that all these barn owls hang in and, and then at night the barn owls just go swooping out and flying around and you can see a lot of barn owls in flight. But generally you're going to see the owl perched um, and it draws your attention to it because it might be hooting. So usually you're seeing a, a, a perched owl. Um, let me now kind of pivot then to people are asking about how do you mix colors? Um, so if you look at my palette, I have a bunch of colors on my palette. Some people have a very small palette, but I actually like to have a variety of colors. But then when I'm doing an individual drawing, I don't use all those colors or it looks like this just crazy quilt. So if Instead, you, but if you can choose your colors and then limit the number that you do in an individual drawing, then you get much more kind of color harmony and color consistency in the drawing. These colors feel like they go with each other a little bit better because I don't have a lot of different colors in there. If I got in here and painted the eye yellow and then this orange and all these sorts of things, then I would have more, it, it, it would feel a little bit more like, oh, that color doesn't quite go with this picture. So by reducing the number of individual colors in an individual, in a picture, and so there's a limited palette within the picture, but you've got a choice of all these things, like what are you gonna do your limited palette with? Um, I think that's a, that's a helpful way to go. My general strategy for mixing a color is that I will, um, First, just look at my palette and say, is there a color on my palette that is close to that? And uh, let me find an object with a color on it. Um, let's see here. All right, here's a little, here's a little present for somebody. And let's say I wanted to mix a color that was matching that color right there, that little pink thing. What I would do is I'd look over at my palette and say, well, um, this is kind of close. And then I just tweak it a little bit by altering that color with either cyan or magenta. This is a little bit too, oops, I guess that, yeah. So I would try to start with something that is close to it but if it needs to be tweaked, I would tweak that with small amounts of cyan or magenta or yellow. So this needs to be a slight little cyan in there. And then that gives me a color, yeah, that's closer to that. All right, so that 
color that I just mixed there is close to the color of that stripe. And, but here's again, what it, it looked like, 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 how do you, but sure, it, but how do you know what colors to reach to reach for to tweak? So this is where, so you can start with any color that seems close. But then here is, here's the critical move. When I tweak my color, moving it slightly to a different hue, I am either going to put in clean yellow, or I'm going to put in magenta, or I'm going to put in the color cyan. Those are the three colors that I mix with. And the reason that I do that is that these three colors, cyan, yellow, and magenta, are, are sort of, those are our true primary colors. It's not red, yellow, and blue. Um, if I put in red to try to tweak something, what I'm actually doing is I'm putting in an unknown amount of magenta and an unknown amount of yellow into my color mixture at the same time because red is not a primary color. Red is a secondary color made out of yellow and magenta. If this idea is a kind of completely counter to everything that you've heard in all these other classes, there's some magenta paint if I take yellow and I put the yellow and I mix it with it, I can mix, I can mix, actually we've got to need to get a little bit more, I'm gonna put a little bit more magenta in here and a little bit more yellow so I can get kind of something that's a little bit of a thicker, more intense color. So I want you to see that I can, that's a little bit too orangey I'm gonna get a little bit more yellow. I mean, sorry, a little bit more magenta into that. And there it goes. There's red. Um, so that, these are actually coming out a little bit gray on this projection. Maybe if I give it more light, that will help. Yeah, a little bit. But you see, I just mixed a color of red that is very similar to the red that is right out of my palette. This one I mixed, this one right here, I got right out of there. But that's to show you that red is actually a combination of magenta and yellow. So the big take home here is that when I am matching a color, I don't want to take some unknown amount of magenta and an unknown amount of yellow and stick it into my thing. I will get a surprise. But if I'm trying to take something and tweak it to be a specific target color, I need to choose, does it need more magenta, yellow, or cyan? And I will put a little bit, one at a time, of those in there. I'm not going to use blue. I'm going to use cyan, because blue is a combination of magenta and cyan. So my formula for color matching, when I want to, and, and, and again, color matching is much, much less important than value matching. Value matching, having things be the right darkness or lightness. I mean, here's, here's an owl and it's orange. But the values are working in it, so we read it as an owl. Um, whatever it is that you're doing, what, what happens is everybody gets so wrapped around the axle about, I got to get that exact color. And they don't spend much time trying to match the value. And so it ends up looking funky. You have a huge range of what you can do with color, but you want to get your values working for you. So <clears throat> let me just do one more example. Um, I find some object, right? Here's a little box and it's got this color of green on it. What I can do is look at my palette and say, um, what, what on my palette is closest to that color? And I'm going to grab this one here. All right. 
So I'm going to start with something that's kind of close. But this is a more muted color. This is much more, this is much too vibrant. Alrighty. So I'm going to get it to simmer down just a little bit by, um, let's see, what do I want to put into this one? Um, I am going to put in a little bit of magenta first and see if that does it. I'm going to try a little bit of magenta. So here's a lot of magenta on my brush and I want a little bit. So I'm just getting rid of a lot of that. There we go. I'm going to put in a little bit of magenta. A little bit more. Maybe that's going to be too much magenta. Oops, let me. So I think I've got it closer, but it's now too dark. So I'm going to bring it over here add more water to it, bring it over here, add more water to it. And then I'm going to line this up on the edge there. It's still too dark and it's too, yeah, let, let me just see what happens if I take this and I really fade it out. Um, there we go. Look at that. All right, so look at that here. Do you see how this green is similar to that one? All right, and so what I did is I first took a color that was close on my palette. I tweaked it by adding a little bit of either cyan, yellow, magenta. Here I tweaked it with some magenta, but then it was too dark so I added more water, it was too dark. I added more water and it was closer. I added even more water and we're on it. So you see what I'm looking at is this little patch right here. And I'm just looking across to see how well I match those colors. Good color, wrong value. Wrong value, wrong, close. And then we're in bingo. All right. That is, that's my strategy. So what I do is I can mix up something that is the right color by grabbing it out of my palette and then either adding cyan, yellow, or magenta. And sometimes I'm going to add, need to add two of those, right? Sometimes I might need to add a little bit of magenta and a little bit of cyan, right? Um, or a little bit of cyan, a little bit of yellow. And I get the right color and then I can dilute it to get the right value. And that's what we did to match the green spot on the side of that box. Did that answer that question? I think so. I think that was a really helpful explanation. You know, when you look at color wheels and things, you have to find like some theoretical opposite you know so you have green and you need to find red and breaking it down into the three colors was really helpful and then finding you know a mix so if you have yellow and you know how to you know tone it down instead of finding purple you might start with a magenta or blue yeah so yeah if yeah, i'm if i'm mixing if i'm color if i am tweaking a color by adding a purple into it yeah that's going to work if I'm just sort of general ballpark want to mute something down. Yeah. If I'm trying to specifically match a color and I take a violet or a purple from my palette and I throw it in there, I now have introduced an unknown amount of magenta and an unknown amount of cyan at the same time. And I'm not going to be able to precisely color match. But by, put, by me intentionally putting in a little bit of magenta and then a little bit of cyan, I can tr control the levels on those sliders to be able to match that color. Yeah, that was really, I don't think I've ever seen generally, it. Generally, like, like you, you've got something that is a bright green, right? And you say, whoa, that's, that's just too much of a crazy bright green. I just want to mute that down. It'll be fine to take some red paint and throw that in there. 
and now it's muted down, right? A little bit more med red paint and it'll be even more muted down, right? And that works. But if I'm trying to actually specifically match a color rather than just kind of like, I need that green less muted, I mean more muted. Um, if I'm trying to specifically match a color, the way I'm gonna do it is by taking a little bit from this triad and pick like how much cyan, oh, sorry, how much magenta and how much yellow do I want to put into that to tweak it to be the color that I need. Yeah, that was excellent. We're at one o'clock. <clears throat> All right, let me, I'm gonna switch the, eh, I'm sideways. Um, back. <laughs> That, so sorry for throwing you folks into my nostrils. Um, here we go. All right. So today, <laughs> I think <laughs> I really do need to um, just give up on the uh, um, the the idea of, of of having a bunch of rapid fire answers because once I kind of get into something, I just distract myself kind of and end up going down some rabbit hole. But I hope this rabbit hole was 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 fun for you folks today. Um, so today we looked at trying to suggest the complex patterns on an L and sort of to make them blend in with the place. Um, to make this owl blend in with the place that I'm using, I'm using a lot of the same colors that I have in the background in my owl. So because those are the same palette, the owl's feathers and the sky and the trees and the owl, they're all going to sort of feel like, yeah, that bad boy is, is, is blending in there. I've got a limited selection of colors on there. We also talked about how are there those those, those vertical bars and the horizontal bars. And you saw me with my brush putting in some little verticals and horizontals. Um, in some places, the verticals are gonna pop out more to you and in some places, the horizontals will. And so just take a look at your owl. And it's gonna tell you where to kind of emphasize those. The last thing we did, to, and we also, we kind of looked at, we put this, this, this owl on a branch and then we made the forest even more deep. Um, if we want that to be even more sort of in the woods. And so you had a chance to kind of look at that. You get a sense that there are trees of different sizes and distances. And by playing with the, where is my, here we go. Playing with the, the tip of that brush pen, um, we were able to get those really cool textures. And again, the this brush pen trick is this brush pen here is the Kuretake water brush. And, um, well, and there's a little palette on my screen that's kind of blocking my way. All right, so here it is, the Kuretake water brush. And um, it has a tip at the end that I can pull off. And I can have this full kind of mop head thing going on here, like this, this full big brush up here. Um, I can, take this plastic tip, put it on there, and get a chisel tip. Or third, what I did today is I took this plastic head and I twisted it slightly. Watch what happens to it when I twist. See that? If I twist it a lot, I get this crazy squirrel texture. I twist it a little bit and I've got something that'll just kind of give me some random blocky texture, then that's what I used today. So I didn't want it going full squirrel. I wanted it just cut back a little bit. So this one brush gives you essentially three in one. Um, and you can, uh, so it's useful. So I use that for getting some of the texture. And then when I'm all done, by the way, with using this, I always sort of put it back in a way that it'll be kind of flattened out and chiseled. So when I open up my brush again next time, it'll be ready to be a little chiseled for me. Kind of train those bristles to be in that pattern. The last thing we did today is we looked at, um, in, in a very brief way, about how I kind of match colors. So my strategy is 
go for somebody who's close on the palette and then tweak it with either cyan, yellow, or magenta, and sometimes two of those. And you, you, you play with that and you're going to be able to match specific colors. And then you saw that I got the right color, but the value was wrong. It was much too dark. And when you're changing values with watercolor, you're not adding white gouache. What did I do? I added more water. And then I added more water. And then we had a match of color and value. I hope that, that was a useful uh, way to, 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 to visualize these things and to, to play with this for you folks today. Um, so let's jump over to our